Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. Today we'll bring you a special program on Chinese culture from the ancient fast forward to the modern. First of all, Dun Huang. For merchants and artists traveling along the legendary Silk Road, the city of Dunhuang in northwestern China's Gansu province is a significant crossroad. These travelers left indelible marks with traditions, temples, and Buddhist arts, making it one of China's most culturally rich travel destinations. The Mogao Grottoes, just outside the city, mainly built during the Tang Dynasty, are an eye popping treasure trope of Buddhist art. It is also a great demonstration of how cultures interact and exchanged throughout different dynasties of China. To know more about this culture, I talked to Neil Schmidt, the scholar in residence at Dunhuang Academy in Gansu, who specializes on the Silk Road and Buddhist studies. He shared deep insights into the Mogao Caves and the surrounding areas of Dunhuang and how the art and culture has evolved throughout history with cultural exchanges between China and the rest of the region. And I'm joined by Neil Schmidt, the scholar in residence at the Dunhuang Academy. Neil, finally, good to see you. Likewise, <laughs> great seeing you as well. You are Welcome sitting in Dunhuang. a dazzling place. Tell me more about it. Where are you? Okay, well, so I'm sitting in front of the Mogao Caves here in a very, very small oasis, about uh, 25 kilometers outside of the larger oasis of Dunhuang. Uh -huh. And you can see behind me, uh, these are the Sanwei Mountains. Wow. Uh, and <clears throat> on the other side, in front of me, are the Mogao Caves. Amazing. I know in order to talk to us, you hide away from all the tourists, but there might be buses <laughs> <laughs> and the security guards, uh, little the, carts uh, passing by. Right, exactly. Uh, sorry for the occasional intrusions. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so we, we have a lot of tourists here now. Thank Quite you good. so much for choosing such a wonderful spot for us. Uh, let me jump directly <laughs> into the <laughs> questions, uh, Neil. Sure. Um, you know, what was your first Dunhuang moment in a way? What about that that has led you to be where you are today at the Dunhuang Academy? Well, that moment happened more than three decades ago uh, when I was a student and I had read a book by a University of Pennsylvania professor mm -hmm. uh, and he had translated some narratives that come from uh, Mogao, from the library cave, which we can talk more about. Uh, and these are Tang Dynasty narratives. They're semi-vernacular. and they were so rich and also his notes, you know, they were so erudite and scholarly and there was so much information. I thought, I, I have to find out more about this place, uh, you know, and uh, that was the initial moment, you know, reading uh, some literature that got me interested. Mm. What kind of literature and what did you read? Uh, what, well, so, what kind of questions yeah, were you so, in your mind and when you started this moment? Well, so th these are Buddhist stories about karma and rebirth. What was fascinating to me is that it was a world that was so different from mine, right? A world, and also a world is in some ways seemingly in the middle of nowhere. And yet, uh, you know, this, this isolated, really remote place, this frontier town of Dunhuang, produced this incredible literature. Um, and at that point, I didn't even know about the art, right? So, mm -hmm. so that was the moment uh, when I said, okay, well, I have to go to Dunhuang. I have to visit. Mm. And of course, uh, Dunhuang has evolved so much, especially research about Dunhuang. There is uh, the so-called uh, Chinese uh, Dunhuang studies and also vis-a-vis -vis the overseas uh, or Western uh, Dunhuang right. studies. Uh, how do you, as an expert, see these uh, quote-unquote terminologies and whether they're really different? Well, um, you know, they, they grew up differently, I could say that. You know, so what happened was in the year, uh, around the year 1900, a cave was discovered with right. thousands and thousands of manuscripts. Um, and later, uh, in 1907 and 1908, uh, scholar explorers came from Europe and, and took a part of those materials away. Um, of course, the, sta the caves were still here. And so <clears throat> what happened with Dunhuang studies is that in the West, uh, they were sort of more concerned with texts uh, the materials that came from the caves. Well, in China, they really developed around the caves themselves and the art in the caves. Mm. Um, but those, uh, so it had to do with access to materials, but that divide is, of course, narrowed greatly over the past century. I know there has been international efforts intensely to focus on 
bringing together all the references that all countries, all experts could have online so that they could have access to it right. and interact with one another. Have those practices yeah. been a success so far? Oh, absolutely. I mean, so when I started studying Dunhuang uh, a long, long time ago, uh, I had to use uh, either Xerox copies of manuscripts. I couldn't actually, unless I went to Paris or unless I went to, to London or St. Petersburg, Leningrad then, um, I couldn't actually see the manuscripts except via sort of bad copies. Um, and so, on the other hand, you know, I had to come to Dunhuang to see the caves themselves, to, to Mogam. And so these efforts is, that started in the 1990s to digitize all the materials have been revolutionary. I mean, they've completely uh, changed the way, for example, I do research in my ability to gather together materials from every, uh, every collection around the world and put them together in ways that weren't possible until the uh, digitization began to happen. Mm. Having said that, though, Dunhuang, as you may know, uh, Neil, has a lot to do with how people interpreted its history, particularly the mm. history of discovering Dunhuang. Uh, there were different yes. versions. Some versions were suggesting, you know, the, the uh, Taoist monk uh, in uh, Dunhuang earlier discovered the cave and then shared that information with his, uh, uh, um, shall I say, um, acquaintance. And then uh, eventually uh, the world got to know. And China, on the mm -hmm. other hand, uh, the research about that only happened a bit later. Uh, however, there are other versions about how Dunhuang's all the materials and the caves were discovered and how different teams mm -hmm. jump on it. What, what, what are some of the research you've been doing about this part of history? I've been interested in, in of course, the story of discovery and how this, this Taoist abbot, uh, Wang Yanlu, uh, found this library cave with all the, you know, a r remarkable number of uh, manuscripts and paintings. Um, and this is uh, in the year 1900. And so that material sort of sat there and it was interesting because he was, he tried to get the attention of Chinese officials to help them understand the, the value of it. Um, but, you know, this is, the, the situation in China at that time uh, was, uh, was not very good. Uh, you know, the various rebellions were going on and, and things were a little chaotic. Um, and so it wasn't a high priority. And it was only then when uh, Westerners came, uh, for example, uh, Aural Stein uh, in 1907 and then in 1908, Paul Pellio, um, that it began to, the materials began to be put on the map. And Paul Pellio was very interesting because he went to Beijing and he shared all the materials that he had with Chinese scholars. Um, so this is in uh, 1909. Uh, and they, and so some of the first studies actually on Dunhuang materials were by Chinese scholars uh, in Beijing at that time. Mm. On the other hand, uh, there are different stories and versions about how those materials were being taken away and also away from China. Mm. Uh, and uh, some were suggesting exploitation, some were suggesting mm, yes. about, uh, you know. Uh, so so <coughs> how, how, how do you see that part of history and the narrative and the rhetoric sure. it seems coming from different sources? Well, I, it, obviously, it's a complex period, and, and it has to do with certain power plays. I mean, for example, Europeans were very, very interested, and in, in also for, uh, for their own uh, sense of uh, confidence and to, to, to make their particular country or nation look better, you know, it was getting antiquities was, was you know, uh, a major way to do this. Mm. And so coming to China, as we all know, you know, this happened uh, frequently. Um, and I have to admit, the way that Stein obtained the materials <clears throat> was, was a bit of a subterfuge. But on the other hand, you know, and I, it was uh, former director Wang Shudong, uh, who is now the director of the Palace Museum, and okay. also the person who hired me um, <clears throat> here, uh, you know, and he, he's, I think he has a good take on it. And he says, you know, well, it's, in some ways it is unfortunate this material left China. But on the other hand, it's been an opportunity for China, uh, for the rest of the world to understand China, mm. right? I mean, these, when these materials went to Europe, um, they created an explosion of interest when they were first displayed in, in various exhibitions uh, in the early 20th century. And they really expanded Chinese studies uh, a great deal uh, throughout the 20th century. They're a real, a real impetus in so many ways. Mm. The other debate, of course, about Dunhuang is how high exactly 
is the standard of aesthetics, of arts, of culture oh. that's reflected in the caves and also the materials that you said discovered in, in the year 1900. Uh, we understand it's a wide range of subjects that Dun Huang, you know, uh, embraced yes. uh, over the hundreds of years. So tell me more about your right. judgment. Well, I think, quite honestly, I think there's no other place like it on the planet. I mean, I, you know, and that's just not my bias. I mean, I, I think it's true in terms of the, the, sheer, the sheer volume of human creativity that we find in these caves. I mean, they, they span a, a thousand year, roughly a thousand year period. Um, they contain all different types of iconography and style, you know, of course, uh, uh, multicultural in so many ways. And there, there are 492 painted caves, and there are 735 caves altogether in this, yeah. this you know, uh, kilometer plus uh, long cliff face here. And yet, if you could think uh, of a hundred Sistine chapels, right? You know, there, there's that much wealth, uh, artistic wealth, and human creativity here. It just doesn't. There's no other place like it on the planet. I, I that's. That's my firm conviction. It's beyond words, I could tell while you're explaining. It is. Absolutely. No, it's, it's, quite, it's quite remarkable, just the, 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 the range of materials um, and also cross-cultural materials that, that the caves contain and the sheer artistry. If we think here we are in a frontier town on the edge of, the, uh, of civilization, so to speak, what was going on in the Tang Dynasty during this mm -hmm. period, right? If, if we're here, you know, uh, a thousand, two thousand kilometers away from Chang'an or Luoyang. Imagine the, the quality of art that existed there. Your specific research, tell me more about it and what angles are you approaching because there's so many people doing research about Dunhuang and mm -hmm. what has mm -hmm. that process of researching taught you about the nature mm -hmm. of the subject you are researching about? Well, so, so I have a large project which is to do a compre comprehensive guide to Dunhuang studies. So materials in uh, St. Petersburg, materials in London, in Beijing, in, in Tokyo, um, and to gather together all the primary source materials, for example, paintings or manuscripts, um, and then also the secondary studies. So, you know, who has worked on, on uh, this type of painting or who has worked on that type of literature? Um, and so as a guide, it, it, you know, because there's so much material, um, it should serve as a, a means for people to enter into the, the depth of, of uh, Dunhuang, Dunhuang studies and all the materials that we have. So, for example, somebody doing economics, uh, you know, they would be able to say, okay, well, you know, what, was, what were medieval economics like uh, in Dunhuang? What, where do I turn to to find those sources or yeah. literature or art, um, all these fields? And I think what's remarkable about materials, for, especially the manuscripts, is that they're so detailed. Um, and they're so immediate, and we have, we have intimate details of people's lives. Uh, we have their hopes and fears, because this material was sealed up in, a, in this cave, the library cave, around the year 1000, and then forgotten about. Mm. And because people reused manuscripts, um, because paper was scarce at certain times, uh, <clears throat> we have everything from uh, students practicing their Chinese characters, uh, to uh, doodles, uh, to monastic economic records, um, you know, just a literature, uh, all the, every manner of, uh, you know, uh, oh uh, script God. and uh, text that, that would have been thrown away. And yeah. so I think it's possible to do, it's possible to do a kind of empathetic scholarship, right, where we really tried to look at the hopes and concerns, uh, the desires, the fears of these people who we have so much detail on. Now we all know it's widely believed that Tang Dynasty is one of those very opened up dynasty of Chinese history. Tell me more about what you have discovered uh, together with other experts about that part of Dunhuang. Well, I think, I think what's interesting is that it's very, very clear that uh, Dunhuang at that time was a composite society of many, many different cultures. Um, and of course, that was true in Luoyang and, and Chang'an as well um, during the period. But here, of course, we have so much material that, that remains from that time. Um, and you really see this cross-pollination. I mean, we have, uh, even earlier, we have caves uh, that have, <clears throat> you know, of course, uh, Chinese uh, deities, but also uh, Taoist deities and Buddhist, Buddhist deities, uh, Hindu gods, even Greek influences. Mm -hmm. And what's remarkable is that it's all in a single space, and it's not conflictual. Right? Mm -hmm. That there's this kind of porousness of cultures, 
Um, but I think also, especially during the Tang Dynasty, there was such a, se a sense of confidence um, in China, uh, in, uh, in the Tang, uh, that uh, people could accept these influences and really play with them. There's this kind of ludic element to, to the, the caves and the ability to mix and match. And then something out of that, uh, uh, very, very creative, uh, comes that is unique in its own. Mm. Tell me more about some of the specifics. What cave, which mural, what Buddha can give you that sense? <laughs> if we got an opportunity once again to go to Dunhua, what are some sure. of the places we must go and visit? I would recommend uh, a cave like 285, which is actually earlier than the Tang, or cave uh, 249, which have uh, you know, these remarkable murals on the ceilings with uh, you know, the wind god and the thunder god, and, and, uh, which are very Chinese gods in this case, yeah. uh, queen mother of the west and uh, king father of the east, uh, you know, but also Buddhist deities, uh, Asura, for example, uh, you know, of course, the Buddha himself. Um, and all these are in a single space, you know, and we have to remember that these caves are like portals, mm. you know, portals, portals to another world, portals to salvation in some senses. Um, and so they're very ecumenical in that sense, and extremely cosmopolitan, extremely sophisticated. Mm. And you know, I'm sitting in the studio. I wish I could be there sitting there together with you. Tell me more about how will this, you know, really fresh and also vivid depiction of the mindset of the stories of the real mm. life of that time inspire you about what to do to research about culture? Mm. I think one of the things that is truly remarkable about this site is that we have textual materials and visual materials, material culture, right? Of course, the, these spaces that you can actually go in and feel and experience what people felt and experienced uh, in, the, in, say, for example, the Tang Dynasty. Yeah. You know, and in these caves, uh, we have, they're multi-sensorial, right? We have, of course, vision, but we have images of thousands of uh, musical instruments, right? We have uh, fabrics that uh, they're painted, right? But they, they mimic fabrics, so there's yeah. something tactile there. Uh, you know, um, uh, senses uh, such as uh, smell. We have uh, images of incense burning. So you really get an idea of, of the richness of these people's lives uh, in ways that are, is extremely rare in other, any other circumstance. And, you know, the caves together with the, the texts themselves are much like an ethnographic collection. So again, we can enter into the details of people's lives, daily lives, uh, on a really, uh, a, a really uh, minuscule, uh, uh, or mi sorry, in terms of minutia, you know, mm -hmm. really detailed level uh, that we simply can't do anywhere else. You know, Neil, I remember visiting not only Dunhuang, but some of the near surroundings. So one of those is the Yangguan mm. Gate. Uh, we know uh, yes. through geography that is one of the ancient gate that China uh, kept closed after the country closed. Uh, and, and, and it's interesting how, you know, the ups and downs of Dunhuang with its rich mm -hmm. cultural exchange, uh, history background, uh, right. related to how China is open and closed throughout history. Yeah. Tell me more about how you see that. Well, it's, it's quite remarkable because I, I think there are uh, some misconceptions about the Silk Road and how the Silk Road actually operated. And it was largely dependent on Chinese government support. Uh, so, for example, when, uh, when in Western China, uh, what we call Xiyu, the Western regions, um, when, when China controlled that area, um, you know, it had settlers out there, it had uh, soldiers out there. Uh, soldiers needed to be paid, and they'd be paid in silk. Um, mm. And so, you know, they, this, was, this was a fundamental means of, of uh, money, in fact, I mean, it's much more convenient than, say, coins. It's very portable. Um, and so because of that Chinese government support, uh, silk would flow westward. Um, but when, you know, the, the Silk Road was shut down in some ways due to uh, certain, uh, certain tribes or certain uh, situations having to do with war or invasions, um, that trade stopped. Mm. Um, so it really had to do with the ability for, for the Silk Road to be kept uh, peaceful and to be maintained, um, and that really allowed for the, the trade to happen. But once that stopped, trade, trade stopped as well. Right, and Dunhuang, not anymore, become the most attractive place because Dunhuang was there because right. of the Silk Road, because of the interaction. Yes, it's a frontier town, right? It was a commandery set up exactly. by Han Wudi, um, 
And so it was at that point that the region began to be stabilized. And, uh, and it's, uh, from that point forward, you know, if, if, there were, if times were peaceful, uh, trade was extremely active. But it had to do with the strategic location of the oasis on the Silk Road, which is actually at the, the sort of mouth of the Hushi Corridor, which is like mm -hmm. a funnel that goes into central China. There's just so much there that needs to be studied. What do you think inspirations our generation can draw from, you know, the enormous amount of research about Dunhuang? Uh, as a researcher, what have you learned as inspiration? It's, it's a place that uh, is inspirational, I think, number one, just because of the sheer depth of human creativity, uh, but also because it's, it's not... As I mentioned before, you go into these caves, they're, they're multicultural, mm -hmm. you know, in so many ways. Uh, and they're not conflictual, right? There, there really is this, this harmonious balance in so many ways of, of, of different cultures, of different art forms uh, that come together in these, these unique spaces here. And I think there's something to be learned from that. There's, uh, as I mentioned before, the Tang Dynasty was an incredibly self-confident period mm -hmm. in Chinese history. And so that confidence, you know, it, it allows people to be open, right? Uh, they're not fearful. Uh, you know, there's a porousness, uh, an ability to accept. Uh, you know, and one of the things that we, I think we forget is that a lot of the, uh, the people who traveled along the Silk Road were refugees, you know, fleeing from places of conflict. You know, and they would come here, you know, which, you know, at times is extremely peaceful for hundreds of years. Um, and were able to share their skills uh, mm. and uh, their knowledge with people here. Um, and I think there's, there's something really remarkable to learn from that. Mm. As a researcher of culture, and as someone who is sitting on a treasure that's already hundreds of years of old, uh, old uh, tell me, mm -hmm. how do you see you know, the world history? Some say it will be progressing, uh, but others mm. suggest there will be always big ups and downs. Uh, some suggest, yeah. well, it's the same logic, just different ways. Mm. Some say right. we're not necessarily going forward, at least for now, maybe going back. Uh, so, uh, Neil, t help me about that. Sure. Uh, well, no, that's a profound question. I mean, I think, you know, that we can't assume a progress will always be there, right? I think it's something that we need to in some ways fight for, uh, you know, we, we need to be well very, very aware that things can, can go the wrong direction. Um, and we need to be hypervigilant. Uh, this is, this is something I feel very, very strongly about. And, and that hypervigilance also includes, uh, being able to share our culture, right? <clears throat> being able to help, uh, each other understand each other's culture. Uh, and like, we just cannot take progress as a given. Mm. Finally, before we go, Neil, uh, Dunhuang Grottoes, uh, together with Dunhuang Academy, have been doing enormous amount of work for the preservation and protection of Dunhuang. Uh, but we know, uh, with, you know, it's just the, 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 the way it is that uh, cultural heritage sites, they erode and mm. disappear. Yes. So what's the best right. way, from your perspective, to protect it? <coughs> uh, again, and, and that's an excellent question because <coughs> You know, here, uh, I mean, the academy, the Dunhuang Academy has been, I mean, they've, they've done Herculean efforts to, to save this place. Um, and they've worked also with the Getty Conservation Institute uh, in the United mm -hmm. States in Los Angeles. Um, uh, and it, it takes a lot of planning. Uh, there are conflicting forces in some ways because, of course, you know, uh, tourist development is, exactly. uh, is always putting pressure on heritage mm -hmm. sites. Um, and so to find ways to manage that and not deny people the experience, right? This is, this is crucial. Um, to allow people to come uh, but maintain the integrity of the caves. Uh, and there are, there are threats, uh, you know, everything from humidity that people bring into the caves uh, and bacteria uh, to wind, um, also earthquakes. Uh, you know, we're on a major fault line here. Mm. Uh, and all it would take is one major earthquake to destroy the entire site. This, I mean, this is... This is, uh, this is certainly possible. So, so the solution, or a partial solution to this would be, is what we're doing now is digitizing the caves um, and making them available to people around the world. Uh, there's a site called e-dunhuang.com where you can visit 30 caves um, and vi uh, digitally tour them, you know, virtually tour them. Um, and the next step is to do something called high volumetric uh, VR, which is, provides an immersive experience for people. 
Um, but we, digitization is absolutely crucial. Um, you know, we've been making a lot of progress on it, but there's a lot of caves to go yet. Yeah. Um, but it's it's moving forward very very quickly, and it's uh, it's it's again it's crucial to be able to share this site with people around the world if they can't come. Neil Schmidt, the scholar in residence of uh, Dunhuang Academy, what a pleasure. Neil, I hope to see you My soon, pleasure. whether in Beijing or in Dunhuang.